decelerate osteoarthritis. Well, our chairman, Dr. K.D. Tiwari is here. Uh, both president or secretary, they are otherwise engaged in another webinar. The president is uh, there in a webinar with British orthopedic surgeons. And secretary is also somehow busy and he, he has expressed his regret that he will not be able to come here. So with the presence of IOA representatives, Dr. Ashok Syam, Dr. Samsul Huda, we have the pleasure of their company. And now we will request our chairman of this rheumatology IOA subcommittee, Dr. Tiwari, have his words of wisdom on this osteoarthritis webinar. Dr. Tiwari, please. Hello, everybody. Can you listen to me? Yes. Yeah. Good evening. I welcome all the speakers, all the eminent speakers of the India. First of all, I would like to welcome our uh, senior most speaker, Dr. S. Jhakar, and uh, though Dr. We are missing Dr. Shivshankar, but wherever he is, he will be seeing the recorded message. So I welcome Dr. Shivshankar and Dr. Navi Jhakar, our general secretary. <laughs> Now, I welcome our uh -huh. eminent... Is it Gujarat? Is it Gujarat? Is it Gujarat? Is it Indian orthopedic? Yes, yes. Dr. Thakkar. Yeah. And yes. Dr. Yogesh Amar, Dr. Shamsu Roda, Dr. Amarnath, Dr. Lakar, and uh, Dr. Majumda. All the eminent speakers yeah. are sitting here and we'll be talking today about the osteoarthritis and uh, latest therapy in the field of the osteoarthritis. So let us start our... Bef call. Th thank start you, thank you, Dr. Tiwari. Uh, we uh, are ha happy that Dr. Naveen Thakkar, Secretary IOA, has made it possible. Dr. Naveen, Dr. Naveen, Th Naveen, can you hear us? Dr. Naveen Thakkar. Naveen, no. can you hear us? Okay, I think uh, his system is on. But, he's, but he's not. Uh, he's, yes. he's muted. He's muted. Somebody can unmute him. Uh, uh, no, I think uh, he's uh, mm. some, somehow engaged in such a way. Okay, fine. At least we can see our secretary there. So yeah. now I will request Dr. Heman Chatterjee. Dr. Heman yes, Chatterjee, sir. yes, your opening remarks. Sir, good evening all of you. My sincere uh, wishes to our uh, very respected Dr. Jha sir, Dr. Majumdar sir. Now, most importantly, this topic is definitely a great topic and it is always useful in our day-to-day. -day. Yes. I think there is some problem with the internet. So to all the speakers on behalf right. of our committee and wishing all the success to the this meeting. Right. Thank you, sir. Now, now Santanu Lakar, I, I don't see him here. Santanu, are you there? No. Uh, now, Dr. Manish Khanna, the yeah, president, uh, president emeritus of Iora, please. Your words of wisdom. Good, e good evening, everyone. So it's always a pleasure to have an academic discussion on various challenging topics. And now the most important topic as osteoarthritis, which is the upcoming, uh, developing, you know, a decade was there and there was only conservative management. Then we have moved to the surgical management. And now so many things, so many uh, branches. So it will be very good and we hope that this evening will be a good discussion with the various recent aspects on osteoarthritis. Thank you so much. Right. Professor Manish, and now comes the president of our very own association, the Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association, Dr. Uh, Dilip. Uh, please, good please, Thank you. Please, Thank you, sir. 
have yeah. your inaugural address for yeah. for this webinar on osteoarthritis yeah oh, good, good evening everybody all the golden speakers and our emeritus president and president and senior most professor jha here under which uh, guidance we are actually performing this uh, type of seminars for a long time actually wonderful this is a very wonderful uh, association and wonderful arrangement awakening of the new generation orthopedic surgeon with new things that is coming up every time we are doing it and i think that this is a uh, is an eye opener for other uh, organizations other sub committees also to start this type of thing already they are the talk with uh, our uh, yeah uh, shiv shankar our president that he remarked that we are actually the harbinger he told that we are the harbinger of opening up the new channels new opening new horizons in all the sub committees of the country so he had got a remark like that so i am very happy he, he will be coming tomorrow in calcutta uh, to do some demonstration of the progress lecture so i i i hope and i i pray that this is a very successful and very memorable memorable recording whether sip shankar will see it later on thank you thank you everybody thank you very much thank you manish thank you jha thank you chatterji and thank you tiwari everybody thank you thank you thank you so we should start it i think without any losing time right so thank you professor dilip mazumdar yeah well president and secretary in absentia of indian orthopedic association all the faculty members well when when we were planning in the first very first informal meeting of the sub committee i had proposed that i have seen a difference in the basic concept of osteoarthritis and this will be one of the topics but our president said that since you are ready with zero negative spondyloarthropathy have it as the first one and then there was another webinar conducted by dr manish khanna and then there was a third webinar which discussed about the different drugs including biologics used for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and hence in this fourth webinar conducted by rheumatology sub committee i will again reemphasize that this is not a committee on osteoarthritis this is a committee on rheumatology of indian orthopedic association and so this society has felt that osteoarthritis has to be brought into focus friends i must tell you that during past decade i have traveled to all the corners of the world and all the important conferences including ula ular and acr and i have found it to my utter surprise that osteoarthritis has been adopted by these rheumatological societies as their own baby and then i had an insight that what has happened that osteoarthritis already is talked about by rheumatologists and then i have found out that there has been a difference in the basic concept so friends the topic of today's webinar is emerging therapy in osteoarthritis can we decelerate the osteoarthritis friends whatever treatment are available for osteoarthritis management they have not been effecting in either slowing the disease or arresting the disease which could have been the best thing done but what else can we make to allow this change to take place well heart failure each one of us is very failure uh, very familiar that there are many smaller issues including blood pressure and other elements which may be cholesterol abnormalities which if treated or not well treated 
culminate into heart yeah. failure. Similarly, the joint with minimal symptoms can lead to a synovial joint failure. Now, what are the sequence of events taking place in osteoarthritis? There is articular cartilage surface fibrillation, which, which leads to osteophyte <laughs> formation. There is simultaneous subchondral bone sclerosis, which is so very important. There is chronic inflammatory response. And all these are driving human osteoarthritis finally to synovial joint failure. Well, what is desirable? Desirable is that we should initiate a specific therapy to forestall progression of osteoarthritis to synovial joint failure. And naturally, we pose a question, can we decelerate the osteoarthritic process? Well, friends, here itself, I would again like to deviate a little and express my gratitude to Dr. Sujit Kumar. If he's here, I would like to uh, acknowledge his presence and his association. He is the head of the medical team of Dr. Reddy's lab. And he facilitated the preparation of teaching module for this very topic. We are very happy to have been associated with you in preparation of this teaching module. Dr. Sujit, if you are here, thank you very much. So friends, in beginning, most cases are indolent of osteoarthritis, some symptoms, minor ones. So, but they become clinically relevant later when either non-immune or immune-mediated inflammatory events, they begin to dominate. And in osteoarthritis, what we say, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease, but osteoarthritis is not an autoimmune disease. So there is not an immune inflammation. The million dollar question is, is it an inflammatory disease? And friends, we must make it clear that osteoarthritis is itis, inflammation, and is not osteoarthrosis. Friends, if we talk about the basic understanding of the pathogenesis, the initial concept has been that osteoarthritis is a consequence of fragility of cartilage matrix. It was only in 1990s that profoundly modified this paradigm due to progress in molecular biology and discovery of inflammatory theory took place. Many soluble mediators such as cytokines or prostaglandins can increase the production of matrix metalloproteases by chondrocytes. But these were not being accepted till 2000. And it was only after 2000, it was, it was acknowledged that yes, synovitis is there as a part of osteoarthritis. It is a critical feature and it is a driver of the osteoarthritic process. And very recently, the development has taken place where I said subchondral bone is so very important. It has a substantial role in OA. It has a role because it works as a mechanical damper. And friends, whenever we talk about pain in osteoarthritis, it is a source of inflammatory mediators implicated in OA pain process. Right, right. So, gener generation of pain, mainly, chiefly, not only, but chiefly, can take place in the subchondral bone. And the deeper layer of the articular cartilage can get degraded because of the subchondral bone involvement. So, Osteoarthritis, which was initially considered cartilage-driven, is a much more complex disease of heterogeneous nature 
and the inflammatory mediators are not only released by cartilage, also released by bone and synovium. Well, arguments in favor of inflammatory theory of osteoarthritis, there is low-grade inflammation, which is induced by metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome is abdominal obesity, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, high serum triglyceride, and low serum HDL. There could be activation of innate immunity and also inflammazing. Now, inflammazing is age-related changes leading to low level of inflammation. So, normally, joint under healthy condition, the synovial sites produce synovial fluid, which nourishes and lubricates the articular cartilage and contributes to cartilage homeostasis. Well, in osteoarthritis, Dr. Raja will tell us in detail that the synovium contributes to articular cartilage catabolism and byproducts of breakdown of cartilage involve the extracellular matrix, which consists of fibronectin and collagen fragments. They induce inflammation in extent chondrocytes and adjacent synovium. So finally, friends, this webinar, we will have the opportunity to hear, hear from stalwarts that the emerging new targets for therapy, will they go beyond symptomatic relief and hopefully induce slowing or stopping of the progression of the disease. Now, may I request the first speaker, Dr. Yogesh Kamath from Mangalore, who speaks on novel perspective in osteoarthritis. Dr. Yogesh, please. I will stop sharing it. Right, Dr. Yogesh. Dr. Yogesh, are you there? Hello, sir, I am here. Yes, yes please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just uh, sharing my screen now. Please. So welcome and, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jha. Greetings to everybody from Mangalore. I am a hip and knee surgeon myself here in Mangalore and uh, I'm privileged to be here. I will give you an introduction on the brief lines taking ahead from what Dr. Jha just mentioned. So clearly osteoarthritis is progressive and we as surgeons are used to seeing it in the late stages where the cartilage has totally worn off. We also know and are taught of progression of cartilage wear from what you can see is grade one. These are arthroscopic pictures softening of cartilage to further decrease in thickening to exposure of the bone. We know the structure of cartilage and our investigations are also tuned to see these structural changes. That is the MRIs and the X-rays. But what actually happens, there is a borderline between present cartilage and absent cartilage when the line for surgery is drawn. But whether there is a anything which can prevent this progress is probably detection of it early before those structural changes do take place. Now, the first and foremost, when you see a patient with probable osteoarthritis is actually ruling out whether there is any other inflammatory process going on. Uh, on the left side, you just see a South Indian perspective. In the monsoon, we think that the water is flowing and it's very, very clean, but it may not always be so. So similarly, in osteoarthritis, uh, you have to imagine that a good proportion, up to half of patients can have predominantly inflammatory pathology. Watch out, these could be early signs of inflammatory disease. There could be many other causes which can cause secondary osteoarthritis, and these have to be taken into account before you 
go down and dictate treatment terms because obviously that would influence your treatment. Arthritis in terms of osteo and rheumatoid have been thought to be diametrically apart, but on the lines of what Dr. Jha said, we know that rheumatoid arthritis as well as osteoarthritis do have flare-ups from time to time. Even though we thought that rheumatoid arthritis was predominantly inflammation, we know now that osteoarthritis also has inflammation in its origin. And we have now defined end organs. End organ damage is the same. We know that immune mediators can be present in osteoarthritis as well. Now, the joint, of course, is taught as the organ with all these components. Rheumatoid arthritis will predominantly affect the synovium, but with greater discovery of the cellular pathologies and inflammatory mediators in various parts, that is the joint fluid, the cartilage, and the inflammatory process, which eventually affects bones, our perspective, and of course, the avenues for treatment are definitely changing. So, again, a South Indian perspective here. Um, of course, uh, it might seem very different. Osteoarthritis is predominantly structural, whereas the other types of arthritis have an inflammatory component. But keep in mind that the behavioral pattern of this disease might change and it might affect differently at different stages. So, uh, the scope and possibility is in terms of treatment are indeed vast. The uh, forthcoming speakers will enlighten you more on the topic um, uh, and uh, we carry on from there. Thank you. Right. Have you stopped sharing, Yogesh? Yes, indeed. Okay. The net problem there, Yogesh. Net problem. Net problem. Now. Can my screen is visible? No. no my, yes, sir. Yes. Okay. My yes, screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, Jogesh, you have rightly talked about similarities between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So, classic cellular inflammation is not a prominent feature in osteoarthritis. Num number of leukocytes in joint fluid is low in osteoarthritis, rarely exceeding 1 to 2,000 cells per ml, whereas in rheumatoid arthritis, it exceeds 2,000. Well, in synovial inflammation present, which is low inflammation, uh, low grade inflammation, it is present in osteoarthritis and it can be indistinguishable from rheumatoid arthritis. But there is an important difference. Macrophages are predominant in osteoarthritis, whereas T and B cells predominate in rheumatoid arthritis. In osteoarthritis, the pro-inflammatory mediator includes the cytokines and the chemokines. Well, with these words, now I can uh, invite Dr. Dilip Mazumdar from Kolkata to speak on clinical manifestations. Dr. Dilip, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so, it is actually this. Are you stop sharing? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Is it seen? Not yet. Now, yes, very that's good. visible. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the Joges has enlightened us uh, very nicely about osteoarthritis and arthritis. Osteoarthritis, clinical manifestation, and differential diagnosis. 
So it's a very simplified way I have prepared it to give you some tips and tricks how to go for the clinical examination. So mechanical axis relevance for clinical features, everybody knows that the long axis deviates this way, that way will make you the varus or the valgus. It's very simple. Everybody knows it about this thing that how much deviation will be there for the varus, how much will be there. So ponder fast mechanics, then mending or fast mending, then the mechanics. It's difficult to know about that. So see, these are the cases of osteoarthritis. They usually come at the end of the journey of all treatment. As in the outset, Jogas has told us. And you see, people come like this with a gate and we go for the examination. So this is the, this is the way they take the support, either a crutch or the help in the hands of the assistant. So this is, uh, everybody knows about these things. I'm not going into that. Yeah. So faulty mechanics and empty measures. And thus, deformity waddles to the destruction. And osteochronogram can tell you about the coronal, but fails the societal, that there is an inflection deformity. History of other causes, aging process, defective lubricating system. See the cause, bent at the knee, at the horizon. This is not at the, not conforming to the horizon. You see, there is the obesity. So, where in the so what is the history? History is the obesity. It's very important to see for the obesity and abnormal mechanical loading is there. See, they can correct the angulation by this. So, clinical manifestations from known pathology to the unknown direction of all tissues around the joint. So, for clinical examinations, we look at the face of the patient first. Then we look at the eyes to feel the storm inside. Begins the clinical journey when he or she walks in, inspecting the general systemic and the local changes, more or less than not. Feel the soft tissue and the joints where it hurts. Ask to move, assist to get more or measure in three measurements, length, girth, and the angle to record, retrieve, and plan for a retrieve. And often then, turns a doubting Thomas, confusing with the differential diagnosis. Friends, finally, the friends of the investigating tool get you to the destination to plan, play the game of treatment, and prognosticate. So what the clinical manifestation is? Attitude, torso, positioning, balance, and fitness of the patient. But then the gate changes started. When it started? Orthosis, shoe, stick, splint, caliper, which is coming into your clinic. Walking distance is reduced. ADL loss, rest pain. Whether there is a rest pain or work pain, or there is a night pain, that is important. The spine, hip also will follow. Skin changes, swelling, there will be locking, deformity, low bone health under the treatment of the teripartite or bisphosphonite. Muscle bulk and strength. You see, in the in the COVID situations like this, I can give you some tips. This one is the nasorma, another is the Socrates. So, what is this nasorma? Is nasorma that you write in your prescription pad: name, age, sex, occupation, residence, mode of presentation of associated disease. And Socrates is nothing but the deformity, limitations, inability, pain, and swelling and limb. So what the Socrates in short, sight, onset, character, radiation, association with others, and time of the course, exacerbating and disease factor, and how severe the pain is. See, the profile cannot be seen from the back. So is there any correction deformity? So clinical features, pain, 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 and pain. Usually low onset of discomfort with gradual and intermittent increase. Pain is more on weight bearing due to the stress of the sinovial membrane as all tissues around the joint is affected. And later on, due to the bone surface, which are reached with nerve endings coming in. 
So diffuse sharp and stabbing local pain and see the uh, mechanics that has been changed a lot, whether there is a horizontal translation. Yeah. So these things will come with lost um, alignment. Patients will come like that with clinical features of pain. What are the types of pain that you face? Mechanical, then increase with the joint, the inflammatory in the phases in the beginning, rest pain later at 50%, night pain 30%. So, the clinical deformities you see for the soft tissue swelling, mild synovitis, mild synovitis, remember osteoarthritis, mild synovitis, small effusion, avoidant nodes for the osteophytes and joint laxity because of the ballooning of the capsule. So, asymmetrical joint restriction leading to ablation. So, what the clinical features in movement, galing stiffness at the period of the inactivity, 15 minutes in the early morning stiffness, poor scapitus, pulpit and here. Flecked of cartilage and evernated bones. We have to the patellar grating for patellar femoral way, L5 tenderness for the lumbar spondylitis, ankle joint tenderness, and osteoarthritis, the hip by seeing the rotations of the hip. So, reduced range of movement, capsular thickening, all has been muscle spasm. So, what is the summary? Loop, tail, move, measure. A patient with the typical way of the knees, the normal standing posture, there is a mild varus angulation of the knee joint due to symmetrical way of the medial tube. So what is the clinical feature to look for the examination? Helgas test, Veras test for the laxity of the ligaments, Lusman test for the atrophic Macquarie test for the meniscus, and waddling, dark waddling for the step. So severity, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, minimal way changes the minimal joint uh, diminution or there is a a decreased joint spin, more risky joint spin to the osteophytes, and alignment is lost in stage four. So, differential diagnosis, as you have got all the investigation to filter out whether it is osteoarthritis or something else, that we have come to a point that it is osteoarthritis. So, osteoarthritis again have got five gradients you see, medial pain, lateral pain, diffuse pain, and so in the medial pain, there will be osteoarthritis, medial collateral ligament, meniscus and bursitis. In the lateral, there is lateral collateral ligament in the middle and the iliotibial band. In diffuse pain, a enter pain, osteoarthritis, petrofemoral syndrome, petrofemoral bursitis and quadricellular And in the diffuse pain, is infectious arthritis, gouty arthritis, pseudogouty arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. This has got the diffuse pain, not sharp pain, remember. And posterior pain is for the Moran Baker system, all of the So, as already told uh, by our Jogesh, this monofocal, the primary way or secondary way. So, this is just a glimpse of the primary way and the secondary way that everybody knows. So, take home track is that where there is a smoke, there is a fire. So, where there is a deformity, there is the degeneration. And see for the bone ends that rub together, that eroded cartilage occurs in the osteoarthritis. Whereas the swollen inflamed annual membrane in the rheumatoid arthritis. So worsens with activity, relieves with rays, whereas it is worsens with the rays and relieves with activity. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. And the osteoarthritis goes on. This is the beginning of the story of everybody's life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Professor Dilip. Thank you. Please just stop sharing it. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So thank you, you Professor Ja. Yeah, yes, you have very nicely covered that what are the source of pain. Am I visible? My my screen is visible? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to. right. So uh, uh, the reasons of pain, what happens whenever joint replacement is done? And then also the patients keep on complaining of pain. So what are the various sources of pain? Has been beautifully classified into anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral, and diffuse. So yeah. the pain sources could be 
in osteoarthritis, the osteophytic periosteal elevation, vascular congestion of the subchondral bone. Again, I am emphasizing the subchondral area becomes so very important. There is increased intraosseous pressure. Synovitis, again, with activation of the synovial membrane nociceptors, fatigue in the muscles even can cause pain. Overall joint contracture, joint diffusion and stretching of the joint capsule, torn menisci, inflammation of the periarticular bursa, periarticular muscle spasm, psychological fractures. Some patients are even conscious of the crepitus giving them some kind of pain and the central pain sensitization again becomes very important. Well, friends, I would like to bring to your notice that like we say, the ULAR criteria for diagnosis of a rheumatoid arthritis. So similarly, this criteria for classification of idiopathic osteoarthritis. And uh, Dr. Dilip, uh, I am uh, very happy that while discussing with you, you said that pure idiopathic osteoarthritis is really not very common. So there are three criteria, clinical, clinical and laboratory, clinical and radiographic. Apart from knee pain, there are six things. A is more than 50 years, a stiffness of less than 30 minutes, crepitus, bony tenderness, bony enlargement, and no palpable warmth. So apart from pain, if three of these six are present, this is the clinical diagnosis, which has 90. 5% sensitive, 69% is specific. The laboratory criteria apart from those six are ESR less than 40. Rheumatoid factor, one is 240. Uh, synovial fluid signs of osteoarthritis with a clear viscous. And as I told you earlier, WBC count is less than 2000. And radiographic changes at, at least Again, the osteophyte must be there. So we have to look to the diagnosis of osteoarthritis in this fashion also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dilip. Now Thank may you. I invite Dr. P. Dhanasekhra Raja from Poem Tour for his talk on recent advances in etiopathogenesis and treatment. Dr. Raja. Good afternoon, everybody. Inspector uh, uh, Sanjay, uh, Secretary, uh, President, uh, Secretary, uh, uh, Chairman of the Tamil Nadu, the Senior Faculty. We are going to talk about the recent advances in etiopathogenesis and genetic uh, conservation. Excuse me, please. All others, put your mic in off position. Who is not talking? There is some sound coming from some mic. Right. Uh, uh, so, you know, osteoarthritis is a whole joint disease. Previously, we thought it was only a cartilage disease. Professor uh, Ajah explained in his introduction that it could be a whole joint disease. And uh, initially, we thought it's due to cartilage matrix breakdown. But we know now synovitis, subchondral sclerosis, and osteophyte formation, and pigmented capsular contracture, everything contribute to the Pathogenesis. You can see the normal cartilage on the left side and the right side there is cartilage degeneration, there is synovitis, neoangiogenesis, subchondral sclerosis, and all these factors contribute to the pathology. So this is a this is an osteoarthritic knee uh, pathology. Uh, it's a uh, sorry. Uh, So we think osteoarthritis is the breakdown of the cartilage. That's not the only thing that's happening. You can see the subchondral bone provides hydration and oxygen to the cartilage. And there is a lot of uh, inflammatory changes happening. There are cytokines released from the macrophages. Cyanide fluid is decreased. Destructive proteins are released and the 
there is degradation of the cartilage and the subchondral sclerosis, osteophytes forms. So if you look at the uh, etiology, there are various phenotypes which cause uh, the osteoarthritis, not just the cartilage breakdown. So there is a different phenotype. It's a heterogeneous etiology. There is the age-driven uh, phenotype, cartilage-driven phenotype, metabolic phenotype. Uh, it's called inflammation. Synovitis-driven uh, phenotype, subchondral bone phenotype, and trauma-driven phenotype. Most orth orthopedic surgeons are familiar with the uh, uh, mechanical phenotype. So if there is a mal alignment or loss of meniscal tissue, or there's a cartilage lesion more than 10 millimeters or instability or trauma to the joint, it predisposes to uh, osteoarthritis. So now we can address this mal alignment or uh, meniscal damage with the uh, corrective surgery. We do high tibial osteotomy, meniscal repair. Now we are gone to artificial meniscus and meniscus allograft. Cartilage can be uh, grown in the lab and cartilage can be implanted. But the basic uh, pathology we need to address, as we know, when the cartilage is broken down, it releases a lot of uh, metabolic enzymes, which stimulate the macrophages and the fibroblasts that in turn causes a lot of inflammatory reaction. There is hardening of the uh, cartilage matrix. There is subchondral bone uh, sclerosis. There is synovitis. This again brings in a lot of inflammatory changes. And the release of uh, cytokines accelerates the changes in the joint. So basically, it starts from uh, because of the uh, enzyme-mediated and cytokine release. The metabolic phenotype, where there is obesity or lifestyle-related problems, there is metabolic reprogramming. It's called inflammation. And there is cellular senescence. It's called SASP, cellular senescence-associated secretory proteins. These enzymes are released, released, which causes, again, inflammation and osteoarthritis. If you look at the mitochondrial level, the cellular level, the normal metabolism happens with glucose utilization via glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. But in aging and other reasons, the metabolism is switched over from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis as a main source. So the mitochondrial metabolism is impacted. This leads to release of reactive oxygen species, which again starts uh, inflammation. So now we move away from the traditional uh, treatment consideration, just giving analgesics, physiotherapy, intraarticular injection, which are symptomatic relief, or finally arthroplasty. We are looking at prevention of disease progression. We are trying to attack the arthritis early and prevent progression. We are trying to have cartilage regeneration and reversal of cartilage damage. So the newer developments are targeted specifically to the particular phenotype. So, for example, we target the subchondral bone of the uh, joint. We give biphosphonates and vitamin D so that the subchondral bone is stronger. There is no collapse. Then we target the cartilage metabolism. We give matrix metalloprotein inhibitors, growth factors like spirpermine, catepsin K inhibitors, which specifically address the uh, cartilage strength and promote regeneration. We also address inflammatory mechanisms like IL-1 inhibitors, TNF-alpha inhibitors, Cucumia longa extracts, these all address the inflammatory mediators like L6, transforming growth factor beta, all these uh, cytokines. We also address pain pathway. We directly address the pain relief by uh, giving uh, specific drugs which address the pain pathway, or sometimes we use intraarticular steroids as well. So it's very important to know what phenotype the particular patient belongs to. It can be a genetic or, or metabolic or injury related so that, so that we can give personalized care for this patient we give particular targeted therapy so for example if cartilage is a patient is cartilage type phenotype we can use perfumin which improves the uh, total joint cartilage thickness the subchondral bone is weak we give zolindronic acid to increase the bone strength catepsin k inhibitor has been shown to reduce bone and cartilage degeneration the target pain pathway by intraarticular trans capsules in uh, uh, molecules so similarly, the metabolic syndrome can be targeted by uh, giving COX-2 inhibitors and metformin. So based on this phenotypes, we can address our uh, uh, disease pathology. So we focus on disease progression and cartilage regeneration. Personalized therapy is important. Phenotyping of OA is very important and there's an active research happening so that we can uh, individually address a particular phenotype and prevent cartilage uh, degeneration and promote regeneration. Thank you for the Right. Thank you, Dr. Raja. So uh, you have talked about the phenotyping. Uh, 
till now phenotyping was uh, not being practiced and uh, and del isola was the person who talked about phenotyping so can you tell us that uh, how phenotyping helps us in in uh, finally management of the individual patient so uh, we have seen lot of similarity between osteoarthritis pathology and rheumatoid arthritis pathology so in rheumatoid we are able to address a specific target like tumor necrosis factor alpha so we, we are able to target that we are able to stop the progression and sometimes reverse the progression in osteoarthritis there is no particular uh, marker in uh, uh, disease uh, progression or initiation but there are sub particular subsets like metabolic phenotype the patient with obese patient with adiposity they have metabolic phenotype they release sasp senescence associated secretory proteins and there are groups like uh, uh, where cartilage is a defect and there are post trauma induced phenotype so there are different phenotypes genetic phenotype we are able to particularly target that type of uh, phenotype like you want to target the cartilage we can have specific uh, drugs to target the cartilage if you want to target the subchondral bone we can target that particular uh, uh, target so for senescence there are anti senescence uh, drugs so we can target pain pathway we can target synovium synovium separately so there are different pathways which we can target so if you are able to identify that phenotype we are able to develop drugs to target this uh, target and we can slow progression right thank you so uh, as you can see in this chart also it identifies individuals at higher risk of progression it identifies patients more likely to benefit from a particular treatment approach identifies specific pathological processes for targeted treatment and identifies the disease targets to develop new agents treatment and strategies well i here would like to talk about a particular cx43 this is increased production of cx43 in the synovium and articular cartilage chondrocytes take place this is very important whenever we want to study that this particular osteoarthritis is more active or has become less active with treatment the assessment of cx43 becomes very important and it is related with it that cx1 and cx2 urine analysis tests are available there well concomitantly various mmps including specifically mmp13 can be seen and mmp13 inhibitors they have been used in the management of osteoarthritis well uh, talking about gut microbe they are also involved in osteoarthritis pathology by modulating the pro inflammatory cytokine il17 activity the potential therapy regulation of the gut microflora in high il17 expression subgroup of oa patients so il17 is the key cytokine which can modulate the gut microbes so this also has to be kept in uh, uh, be taken care of now may i call upon dr ss amarnath from bangalore who speaks on classification investigation and imaging dr amarnath please dr amarnath are yeah. you there yes. yeah yeah i'm i'm there dr jal if sure. you are able to allow me to share the screen please sure oh sorry sure. uh, dr jha one point you should tell uh, later on right later on one point you tell about the subchondral bone vascularity okay right uh yeah i think uh, are you people able to see my screen no uh, no uh, not yet 
not yet yeah yes yes yeah now it it's come on okay wonderful now thank you dr ja thank you uh, dr manish doctor thank you dr dilip and dr tiwari shiva and obviously uh, you know navin for giving us the opportunity uh, to share our thoughts Six minutes is not sufficient. In fact, six hours is not sufficient. In fact, six days is also not sufficient to talk about osteoarthritis. It is such a wide subject. And keeping that in mind, today we are talking osteoarthritis on classification, investigation, and imaging in and in between the ongoing the challenges that we all face in the world and we are facing. A lot of things are going to be a part of our, you know, the therapy the part of our investigation the part of our you know treatment protocol that we can talk about um and with this in mind i hope and everybody is immune or at least vaccinated uh, and we take it forward osteoarthritis coming to classification i think uh, yogesh dilip and raja has given a beautiful uh, narration on how way what and a lot of things have been uh, going to be in and out of uh, you know what shall i say is similarity will be there in the slides or probably the subject some of them so hence i would i would definitely take a key point here to uh, make sure that we will look at the symptoms and how do we classify and how do we take it forward keep in that in mind i mean obviously we all know that uh, we have different variety of deformities coming in so we need to make sure we don't get there that is the biggest issue that is the biggest uh, you know criteria for all of us to make sure keep it early pick it up early so that we can you know avoid these challenges in the classification i think briefly mentioned earlier on by i know dr dilip they have pathological and radiologically we can classify now coming to you know uh, pathologically we can talk about primary and also secondary so, points have been touched upon by all the three speakers i'll just run across you know few things what can be a part of our you know ongoing uh, issues that is going to be majorly affecting us because that is a key factor for us we need to treat the condition where we are coming from not just the symptom of pain yeah pain relief is the main thing agreed and information control is the biggest thing but we need to be very clear as to where and how we can talk about it so the time is running out and obviously i'm going to be running through this entire uh, you know uh, number of slides by varying we have different variety of uh, you know uh, uh, deformity coming in because of the degeneration happening in a different region so let us classify from you know 0 to 1 kind of a you know grade in radiological docking the best classification has been taken and there are a lot of classifications i will not run through that but one example to talk about is the kl or probably the calgary lorets we all know that grade 1 to grade you know or probably you can talk it as grade zero which could be the normal one you know so so there are five grades of arthritis uh, or the knee grading can be done and that definitely makes a point for us to take it forward in terms of our you know treatment and what stage they come in and how we can treat further and also predict the kind of treatment that we can talk about it coming to the hematology or the blood investigations there are quite a few things that we need to talk about it so let me talk starting with uh, hematology and serology now as a patient comes in clinical examination in fact the biggest thing is history history and clinical examination gives us almost 90 to 95% of what you know diagnosis they say but today we are not just talking about just that you and i know that today we are practicing legal medicine so you need to substantiate and make sure that patient gets the right kind of systematic way of approach so that he or she gets you know the better you know pain relief and the quality of life at whatever age they come in from mind you osteoarthritis is coming in very early now not just old age it is not a symptom of old age anymore so that's the biggest challenge depending on the kind of patient either a male or a female there are certain tests that we need to include these are by and large you know we need to include in our investigations very very important because this plays a very important role in differentiating the secondary causes and the treatment protocol that can be taken forward so keeping that in mind the next the biggest thing dr dilip mentioned about the softening of the bone yeah osteoporosis is the biggest thing 
And, ah, there's a spelling mistake here. I'm sorry about that. It's biomarkers. Uh, it's, pardon me for that. And then we talk about the synovial fluid. It's a big effusion comes into the joint and then what happens? We aspirate and throw it in the bin. Mind you, it's so important for us to take it, get a serum, I mean, you know, synovial uh, fluid analysis made and examination made microscopically, physically, and we need to look at the culture and sensitivity. If there's an infection, if there's a crystal arthropathy coming in, a lot of things are there, very, very important factors that need to be kept in mind. So these are the some pointers that we keep in. In the, in the radiological uh, you know, investigations, what do we talk about? I think it's been done already, but the modalities are very, very good ones. The basic X-ray right from the time of Roygen's uh, you know, invention. Today we have, we talk about get a standing AP. Classically, every radio technician, radiology technician makes the patient lie on the table and get the AP lateral. It's fine if the patient is you know, not able to or differently able or if there is any uh, issues. But by and large, we need to get this because we need to see a lot of uh, you know, uh, alignment from the hip joint, pelvis in fact, pelvis to down the knee to ankle. So very, very important. And then to talk about, we also have you know, in the tier one and tier two cities where they may not have an access for a lot of higher investigations, Skyline is, makes a big, big importance. Scanogram again is limited to the digital X-ray uh, you know, units throughout the country. So that is one. Ultrasonography is one of the biggest musculoskeletal, you know, radio diagnosis tool that has come in in the recent past. In fact, orthopedic surgeons are also getting a training done there. Sports medicine, people are getting trained under that. And then it's a very important tool. We don't need to get really worked up. I and mean, if you're not, you can refer them, but you need to have a good hand of, you know, ultrasonography. CD scan is a major important thing. MRI, no doubt about it. Yes, bone density makes a big, big impact. Scanogram, we need to see the alignment of the bone, basically, so that we can plan our treatment accordingly. Then comes our, uh, you know, the grading comes into picture, different pictures, different stages, is it mono or, uh, you know, unicord I mean, uni unicondyle or bicondyle, and, you know, tri-compartmental, all those challenges. We've seen this in, in time and again. We go on and on on these things. So, the, when you follow up a patient, you could see the progress happening. You could have prevented or probably, you know, kind of thing. You know, that is one, one of the biggest things that we talk about. Now, coming to ultrasonography, you need to have an orientation where it's the probe, how you are interpreting each and every structure that we will see and scan it. So keeping that in mind, what are we talking about? There could be a probe which is coming in and then you're screening from anterior posteriorly. How do we see the structure? You know, that is very important for us. There's not the time to class to give a detail, but this is just to give you a you know bird's eye view of investigation. When you do it on the medial side, you could see an image differently again. That has to be interpreted the way we can scan it. Very important. And again, mind you, it is not just radiological classification. We also have ultrasonological classification of the osteoarthritis in the knee joint. Very important. I will not take the time. Now, CD scans, very important because there are a lot of other structures which may not be picked up in the X-ray. We need to rule out and make sure that is happening. And then see, that is the biggest challenge now. It, osteochondritis happening here and chondromatosis happening and so many issues the joint may have. We may miss out in the radiology of the common simple X-ray. So that is important for us. But that doesn't end the show there because we need to see the soft tissues as well. And then how is the damage happening in the soft tissues? That gives us the clarity. The biggest tool that each of us can think about is MRI. So very important for us, the MRI grading of the osteoarthritis is another classification coming in. I don't want to confuse you with too many classifications, but yes, MRI makes a big thing. And again, MRI can be plain MRI. Also, we could have with the uh, you know, contrast. Here, we talk about a proton density weighted, or that is actually a T1, T2 uh, images can be done. And if necessary, in the past, we did what is called an arthrogram, where we used to inject a dye. Today, it's history. We don't even do that. So today, we can do that with uh, you know a simple dye injected into your vein, and then you know, everything is taken care of. So very, very important for us because the treatment lies in a massive way in the kind of staging. So with this, I uh, give a short uh, bird's eye view of investigation, classification, and imaging uh, in osteoarthritis. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Amarnath. So you have been excellent under the time constraints that you had. Uh, but in the meantime, Professor Dilip wanted me to tell something about the vascularity of the subchondral bone. Well, Professor Dilip, yeah. uh, as we say, it is a low-grade inflammation and the subchondral bony area gets, uh, gets more blood supply. And since there is more blood supply, there is congestion and that could be a cause of pain, number one. Number two, gradually the subchondral bony sclerosis takes place and it is observed by some persons that this may be the only feature, only the first radiological feature visible. But other set of persons feel no, subchondral bony sclerosis can be seen only in the later stage. So whatever it is, initial hypervascularity, local engorgement of blood vessels, production of pain, and then subchondral bone sclerosis is the chain of events taking place at the subchondral bony level. Now, uh, Dr. Amarnath, you have very rightly said, you have very rightly said that imaging becomes so very important and visualization of OA features can be seen in the ordinary Rohengionogram. But additional imaging, as I have, you have already detailed, MRI, ultrasound, they can see the synovial hypertrophy, synovitis, and cortical erosions. You talked about traditional MRI, but there is also functional MRI, which detects biochemical changes in the cartilage. Did you talk about it, Dr. Amarnath? No, no, no. All right. And... There is something else known as compositional MRI. This compositional MRI evaluates biochemical properties of the tissues and it has the ability to assess pre-morphologic biochemical changes of the articular cartilage and also in tissues in and around the joints. Then there is a hybrid PET and, M PET and MRI combination and MR cartigram becomes very, very important when you want to see the depth of the articular cartilage. Contrast enhanced MRI, well, in pain phenotype typic patients, synovitis, bone marrow lesions, and meniscal abnormality could be seen. Well, in MR cartigram, we can assess the depth of the articular cartilage. Well, Another important highlight that I would like to make that biomarkers become so very important when we are trying to evaluate that this particular therapy has become uh, uh, effective or not. And then these biomarkers, three things become very important. Serum, COM, serum, uh, sorry, urinary CTX2. I, I had talked about urinary CTX2 and the serum hyaluronic acid. Now, serum pump is cartilage oligometric matrix protein, and this is a specific serological marker, which is present in the synovial fluid and also in the blood, because when the cartilage disintegrates, this is the biomarker which you can assess either in the synovial fluid or there in the blood as well. Urinary CTX2, I have already enumerated, and similarly, hyaluronic acid also help in assessment. Now, without wasting any time, I would request Professor Abhay Elhens, who will be talking about treatment algorithm, NSAID, most importantly, DMOADs, development of personalized therapeutics also. Professor Elhens, your time starts now. 
Thank you, sir. Can right. I share screen? Yeah, yes, just a second. Right. Yeah, at the outset, my uh, extreme gratitude to Professor Jha, uh, to Dr. Manish, and to Professor Majumda. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just to start on, uh, when we talk about personalized medicine, it is like the new shirt that I want to wear. And when we talk about personalized therapy for osteoarthritis, uh, we need to understand where we are coming from. And essentially what that means is that uh, the disease pathogenesis of OA is not fully understood. But the central hallmark of disease is that it is slow, it is chronic and shows progressive destruction. The disease, however, has shown that it involves predominantly the bone cartilage and the synovium with a lot of interest lately in the cartilage. And the current treatment options of osteoarthritis vary from pain relief to improvement of function. And therefore, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the intra-articular steroids and hyaluronic acid injections have very little effect on actual structural degradation of the joint. And these patients eventually land up into reconstructive surgery in the form of total, hip total knee arthroplasty. So the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, as I've already said, uh, there is no role of a single agent like paracetamol. The pain relief can happen with drugs like diclofenac to the to a, a drug dose of about 150 milligrams per day. And one has to be careful about certain uh, renal parameters which can get damaged and distorted. And this is a very, very interesting graph. And this is basically the reason why the world is talking about uh, targeted strategies for osteoarthritis. So till this time, the cartilage, the joint cartilage does not show a full thickness volume loss, even to the stage when the cartilage has had a focal thickness loss, one can get the cartilage to regenerate. And that is essentially basically across the globe, causing scientists to study the mechanisms of damage, as well as study the personalized therapies leading to regeneration. And what basically uh, is the hallmark of this, uh, uh, this period of growth is a branch of medicine called precision medicine, which essentially, as has already been talked about by uh, Dr. Raja and even Professor Marumja, uh, uh, Majumdar and Dr. Jha alluded to this, one has to identify that osteoarthritis is not the common mechanical degenerative osteoarthritis of the knee or, or the hip or uh, the hands but it consists of certain primary and secondary phenotypes. And it consists of certain age-related and systemic and inflammatory phenotypes, certain intra-articular and extra-articular phenotypes. And what these phenotypes do, and that as Dr. Jha was just talking to us about is that the window of opportunity opens up essentially because each one of these phenotypes have a quantifiable measure of certain very specific neurochemicals in the synovial fluid, in the blood, or in the urine. And that is the reason and the focus of where and how targeted therapies can be accommodated and can be focused upon. To an extent that people have actually come out with something which is called a B-score, which is like equivalent to a T-score of a DEXA scan, which is used for quantifying the degree of osteoporosis. So the degree of targeted therapy or stratification of drug therapy for osteoarthritis also, according to certain scientists, can be focused and scored. Now, what should precision medicine include? Essentially, it should include identification of the basis for personalization, a reduction of risk factors, targeted therapies, and personalized realign realignment procedures. And the bulk of these drugs essentially cause a, a prevention of a cartilage breakdown and promotion of cartilage repair, 
They are targeted at the synovial inflammation in osteoarthritis, as has already been discussed beautifully, and they are targeted at the subchondral bone remodeling in osteoarthritis. So a lot is being done just basically to make sure that we do not land up into the end stage disease treatment in the form of arthroplasty or realignment osteotomies, but for certain targeted therapies. And one of the most important ones of these are the metallic metalloprotease inhibitors. And these MNPs, as we understand, are essentially drugs, are essentially uh, uh, chemicals which are present in the articular chondrocytes. The beauty of MNPs is that it has a dual role in the joint. It is involved in pathological destruction of tissue as well as in remodeling and repair. And the drugs which are focused at inhibition of MMPs actually not only cause a, a stoppage of the pathological destruction, but also sometimes can play around with the repair function of these MMPs. And there has been a beautiful trial and the most talked about drug PG116800, uh, a matrix metalloprotease proteinase inhibitor. What has come to light about this drug following a one-year dose response study is that uh, after, the, after the usage of uh, uh, the pre-described dose of this study, there has been no change in the joint space narrowing or the functional outcome scores in patients of osteoarthritic study as said a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Coming to bisphosphonates, well, the focus of these drugs is in, loss of, uh, in working on the loss of structural integrity in the subchondral bone compartment. And these are anti-resorptive drugs, which essentially are osteoclastic inhibiting factors. And the most of the studies has been done uh, on risidronate through two fantastic trials. Uh, one of them is a COSTARS trial, but both these trials after a one and a two years uh, follow-up has shown that at all doses of risidronate, there has been absolutely no uh, improvement in the functional outcome scores and the drug did not radiographically protect, prevent disease progression. Coming to cytokine inhibitors, there are various types of cytokines as Professor Jha also beautifully uh, alluded to. And these are expressed by cartilage and by the surrounding tissue and have a major role to play in the development of osteoarthritis. So starting from interleukin-1 to interleukin-17, as Sir uh, very nicely told us, these, there are numerous drugs which have been known and through numerous pathways uh, involved, uh, involving, uh, including TIMPs and NOS, which have been studied and uh, worked on uh, to see if they actually help in any kind of uh, stoppage of the progression of osteoarthritis. Calcitonin, a drug with a, uh, with a three decade of usage for osteoporosis has been recently reported to have been studied on the cartilage component of uh, osteoarthritis. And this drug essentially has been studied in a phase three placebo controlled trial and has been shown not to have too good an effect on the progression of disease or its ability to prevent uh, the uh, radiographic progression of the disease. There are other drugs uh, such as HCT-12-3012, uh, which is essentially a derivative of naproxen and has been known uh, uh, basically as a COX-2 inhibiting uh, drug working through the nitric oxide pathway. But this too has, uh, despite certain trials, is in development and has not shown any confirmed, uh, confirmed positive role in the inhibition of uh, progression of osteoarthritis by drug therapy. Coming to doxycycline and antibiotic, which, has, uh, which was worked on and has, there have been a study on 431 women and was reported that the joint space narrowing was reduced in obese women by 33% after 30 months of treatment. But the, uh, this particular study was a relatively small sample size with a very small follow-up and this drug could not be, represent, uh, uh, could not be recommended as a chondroprotective drug despite this uh, 
the good results of this particular study. Coming to drugs like diserin and glucosamine. So these drugs have recently had a renewed interest uh, following uh, certain additional roles. And these were essentially drugs which were uh, interleukin-1 inhibitors. And uh, essentially what has been observed is that even though there was a statistically significant benefit uh, of these drugs on cartilage uh, degradation and damage, uh, the ultimate role in protection of disease and progression of disease has not been documented and has not been strongly verified. Coming to cell-based therapies, so that is a focus of a lot of uh, research as of today. And the basic stem cells which have been uh, focused on for the research is mesenchymal stem cells, embryonic stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, and the adult stem cells. But what has been observed is that all cell-based therapies which have been used for treatment of osteoarthritis lack standardization with respect to the qualitative and the quantitative characterization of the methods used for cell harvesting, processing, and transplantation of the cell back to the source, which is the patient. And thus the well-conducted randomized clinical trials, despite their uh, very, well, uh, uh, very well thought of research methodology have been found to be inconclusive, particularly in their ability to demonstrate efficacy with disease modifying results. So in the end, we come back to uh, what we understand and know and the take home is that if you study the osteoarthritis patterns of hip, knee and the hand, what we know very strongly is that there are certain established therapies which, uh, which include, uh, which are basically very well known for uh, uh, prevention of pain induced by the osteoarthritis and certain physical therapies which help in uh, progressing, in preventing or uh, delaying the progression of disease. But if you see the, the, there has been a lot of focus and emphasis and on research on the new uh, medical and the drug therapeutic drug modalities involved in osteoarthritis, but their actual role in progression of disease and uh, progression protection and, and prevention of uh, radiographic progression of disease is still to be verified and it is still to reach a point where they can become a standard of care for patients of osteoarthritis. So thank you for your time. And uh, back to you, uh, Professor Jasser. Right. So, Professor Elhans, you have talked about extensively about various DMOADs. DMOADs or DMODs. And uh, I think the focus of the management is both, should be both on bone and articular cartilage. So there has been a renewed interest, as you have rightly said, on calcitonin and bisphosphonate. It works at both the levels. Do you have any more comment to make? Sir, there has been a lot of interest and there has been statistical significant, statistically significant development also in the researches. But these researches and these findings are yet to reach a point in time where we can categorically say that they prevent progression of osteoarthritis. So, the, so we actually do not know whether they help in delaying the progression of disease or they can actually prevent the progression of disease, which uh, again, it is, it, is a, it is a step in the treatment of osteoarthritis but in the end, we are still short of drugs which can help progression of disease and, deal, and avoidance of uh, the surgical options of end-stage osteoarthritis. Right. So definitely you have said search is still on. And there are, I'm happy to say, phase two trials. Some of the drugs are on phase two trials. Well, you have talked about them. Uh, MMP13 inhibitors are very important and there, is, uh, there are chances that it will prove out to be one of the illuminating drugs to come in future. Well, inhibitors of inducible nitric oxide synthetase also is in focus 
and personalized treatment you have already said is so very important and hopefully in times to come there will be personalized therapy available for each individual or at least a group of patients thank you thank you very much professor elhans thank you and sir now i invite once again dr yogesh kamath from mangalore who speaks on exercise therapy and visco supplementation dr yogesh please thank you very much again sir uh, greetings again from mangalore i am just waiting to share the screen please and uh, yes i have done it now uh so uh, i am going to talk for the next few minutes on exercise therapy and injections in osteoarthritis particularly visco supplementation now we have talked about progression of structural damage in cartilage and we have talked about some certain drugs which might prevent this so far but we now come to the stage where if some structural damage has already happened then what so uh, these terms have been vaguely referred to as early osteoarthritis in the literature and vague knee pain has often been described as chondromalacia so chondromalacia is when the surgeon does not really know what the structure changes but uh, changes for the patient has problems a more appropriate term which has emerged and which more scientifically describes early cartilage pathology is chondropathy so with the emergence of cartilage scanning mris we now uh, very well define chondropathy and uh, would uh, not refer to anything as chondromalacia because chondromalacia would signify that the surgeon doesn't know what's happening now uh, uh, of course of course again we still can do other therapies apart from medical therapy before the structural changes come up and indeed the evidence has been in exercise treatment now you might consider exercises in the form of physiotherapy a uh, particular exercise which people uh, 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 assume with uh, you know uh, sports or at the gym and uh, people are also advised limited modification of certain activities modification of some other things and so on and so forth now all of these things work if they are done in the right perspective what clearly doesn't work or has very less compliance is use of braces in the long run because these braces really would only work as pressure and lead to muscle wasting i must mention yoga and early naturopathies which have taken origin in our country and with the acceptance of one of our colleagues uh, professor john ebnezer as uh, an awardee at national level this is actually even been uh, recognized and put forth in the aaos uh, uh, recommendations we should hence be proud here now uh, in terms of exercise therapy a lot more new treatments are emerging and we ourselves in mangalore are researching this particular one where we make a patient stand on a force plate these are people who documented early osteoarthritis and we see a measure of their proprioception that is a plot of their center of pressure which the force plate uh, uh, plots over a 30 second period and variance of that suggests that their proprioception is bad a tackling proprioception at an early stage is known to be actually helping them better and that's what uh, we've actually devised an algorithm and got a prize at uh, at a uh, innovation conference um, at india level anyway so there is also role of traditional medicine there are uh, various kinds of chondro protectives which are not available uh, and and i won't go too much into the details of this but along with that there are known and uh, uh, rightly popularized different injection treatment in the knee now classical and time tested is steroid which works well in inflammatory flare ups and what i'm going to talk about today is hyaluronic acid there's of course the new kid in the block which is prp and uh, that will be touched upon by my colleague late 
So hyaluronic acid is actually a component of the synovial fluid. What we are trying by means of the injection is basically uh, trying to restore the balance, give it some better lubrication. And we, we also know that it probably works in anti-inflammatory as well as nociceptive modes. Now, there might not be a lot of evidence. The evidence here is basically that the drug is safe to use. However, it has not been recommended by the international societies. Now, uh, despite this, there are various indications and patients who desire to delay operations, who uh, would rather have some intervention actually find popular usage for this particular thing, even though it may not find acceptance in many insurance companies across the world. The important thing to note here is it is not just recommendations, but if it helps patients and it does help a large number of patients, as long as you do it safely, it does have a role. And uh, the side effect profile really is minimal. Uh, it can be used very much on its own. It can be used in combination with steroid or in combination with PRP, especially to reduce the inflammatory effects related to the white cell components when we put PRP in the knee. So uh, PRP on its own can sometimes create a, a septic arthritis type of reaction, whereas HA addition will actually prevent that. And HA also acts as adjuvant therapy and as a substrate when cell therapy and cartilage regeneration is done. So there's multiple uh, usage there. The theory in different types of HA, this is a busy slide, but just to drive home the fact that there are many preparations available out there. What has, if I had to summarize that, there are uh, ones which are AV, of course, very popular, and the new ones which are essentially recombinant DNA technology from microbial sources. These newer ones would have a lesser side effect profile because they are not uh, uh, proteinergic. Now, the higher molecular weight ones are known to be better in terms of longer lasting the earlier lower molecular weight ones had to be repeated and are therefore going out of hope because repeat interventions would put a knee prone to development of infection. However, with adjuvant treatments, one would have to go, the science says, with evidence that low molecular weight goes better as adjuvant when you use it in combination with PRP. So that's in a nutshell about these two exercises. I will pass on the stage uh, back to Dr. Ja and uh, we have to answer questions later on this. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Thank you, Dr. Joges. One thing that uh, exercise was included. Now, invariably, the patients keep on asking that, doctor, am I allowed to run or walk? So what is the evidence-based answer to this particular question? So evidence-based here clearly is that uh, running would create more impact. Now, uh, also they ask about sitting down on the floor and things like that. So if somebody has documented mechanical wear in their knees, we know that impact related exercises could increase that pain and over time uh, fasten their wear and tear. So what we would advise is it's not that they cannot exercise, they can get their aerobic exercise by relative non-contact exercises, which are particularly cycling and uh, uh, running on or rather exercising on a cross trainer rather than on a, uh, a treadmill. Uh, we also uh, have to include addition of supplements like orthotics, which reduce the impact in early cartilage wear. I hope that kind of uh, specifically on right. So I think question, uh, Dr. Ja. you, you apart can... from that, it is very important to institute specific quadriceps strengthening exercises because that shares the impact of the knee. Right. And uh, brisk walking is safe and you can allow your patients to yes. go for uh, brisk walk. Yes. Uh, wow. Provided point. the ground is not irregular and provided yes. they're not doing up and down slope. It okay. is down slope which gives the highest impact on the knee. Up right. 
slope is relatively okay. So if somebody, you know, the common notion is to uh, go take the lift when they're going upstairs and come down the stairs running. Actually, it should be the opposite. Up the stairs is better for the knees. Up the stairs is better for the heart. Downstairs, it is more impact on the knees. So you should take the lift coming downstairs. All right. Uh, Jogesh, uh, two points. Yes, sir. Number one, open chain, closed chain exercise. Huh? Yes. It's, it's number two, it. number yeah. two, different colors of band of rubber bands are there that assist in the uh, developing the tone of the muscles. Yes. So these two, you have to please clarify. Yes. Yes. Uh, would you like me to talk more in detail about it? So, uh, no, very a person, brief. outline, outline. Yeah. Briefly, yes. briefly. In a person who has more pain, it is difficult to institute closed chain immediately. Now, a closed chain helps particularly to develop a good feedback and develop a good gait. So closed chain is when the ground reaction force is acting, when we do exercises standing and we institute squats, that is half squats particularly. Open chain is sitting at the gym, pushing up weight. Uh, with no ground reaction force. Open chain is usually instituted first because it can help relieve pain better. But in terms of getting the patient back to activity, closed chain uh, can later be instituted. It has to be done when the inflammation scenario is a little lesser and uh, at uh, a right combination for a regular exercise, it has got to be a good combination of open and closed chain. Right. Thank you. So, uh, I just want to bring to your notice that there is a Eurovisco group study which have uh, followed up their patients with Visco supplementation for 6 to 12 months and they had significant improvement. Now, they have classified that four different case scenario post visco supplementation can be there. Number one, patient remains symptom free. Second, remains minimally symptomatic, but with no increasing pain. Number three, minimally symptomatic, but with increasing pain. And number four, patient becomes symptomatic again. So are you aware of such uh, uh, results? following visco supplementation? Uh, sir, there have been uh, studies published. This is uh, actually a larger group, multicentric study, which is nice. Uh, uh, but essentially, the studies which have been available so far have been more uh, with intervention of the companies themselves. Genzyme, which was the main marketeer of this brand, has uh, invested in a lot of trials which uh, have shown, uh, you can say, up to level two evidence with use and some improvement of symptoms. Uh, uh, the other people would probably slag it off as circumstantial because these were done in specific centers. Um, they have shown improvement of scores and things like that. Uh, because it is not standardized and accepted overall, that's probably one of the reasons we've not got, um, you know, overall acceptance wide acceptance by the uh, uh, association, so to say. But right. Uh, um, right, Dr. Amarnath wants to draw a point. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jal. In fact, you talked about the Euro uh, Visco supplementation study, Dr. Jal. And then Yogesh, yes, I agree with you. Uh, I was a part of, uh, I was a prime, you know, uh, principal investigator for the study which was done in India, which is called as OSS. And we followed up for about uh, for 24 to uh, you know 48 months. And level two, I think I would definitely say 84 percent of, which is similar to the Euro, uh, you know, Visco. We came out four years and five years, almost 60 months. 84 percent, I mean, 84 percentage of the you know patients who had the injections were 400 or patients were picked up in 25 cent to 22 centers in India. And uh, it was a multicentric study, but yeah, the last sentence, what he said, I agree with you because uh, being uh, promoted by the parent, uh, you know, uh, organization which uh, you know uh, did the uh, research, so that's where the whole key factor came into, uh, you know, low key, you know, so that's where the acceptance level were the question. But definitely, there are a lot of studies. I think a lot of 
needs to be done. And then I think we have a very good scope, uh, you know, uh, probably post uh, pandemic now. Right. right. Thank you, Professor. Uh, sir, can I have one? Yes, sure, Hello. sure. Please, please. Uh, sir, good evening, sir. This is Dr. Keshkar from Calcutta. Uh, sir, uh, we are the regular user of these MISCO supplements and we are in the high molecular weight. Uh, this thing, uh, hydrogen on, one. So the results are quite encouraging, sir. Uh, particularly in early osteoarthritis, it uh, it works well. Uh, and uh, since last uh, three years, we have used more than 500 cases uh, in uh, cases, and results are quite encouraging. Particularly uh, even in grade two, up to up to grade two, they are KL grade two. They are saying you one can use, but uh, since it is freely available, so just. Uh, to delay the TKR, total knee replacement, we are using even in grade two plus, or you can say grade three, there also it works well. So results are quite interesting. Yes, your experiences are most welcome. And now, friends, we have a subject of which we do possess a master presenter, Professor Manish Khanna. Mm -hmm. Professor Manish Khanna, is not only an orthopedic surgeon, as all of us know, he is the founder also of the Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association as the initial secretary, and now he is the president emeritus. He has in-depth study and knowledge of stem cell study and so he is the fittest person in this group, not only this group, rather amongst the orthopedic community who can speak with authority on potential cell therapies. So Professor Manish Khanna speaks on upcoming potential cell therapies. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, please allow the slide to be shown. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. You are here. Yeah, it's, I'm visible. You are visible. Your slide wow. will become visible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for the uh, introduction. Sir, uh, we are going to uh, see uh, in coming seven, eight minutes some of the slides which will uh, very well clearly define so many questions which have been discussed on this forum for the last uh, half an hour, like the walking and different patterns. So uh, without wasting time, uh, let me start the thing. So definitely we are here for the evolution, supporting the evolution rather, as I have already mentioned initially. Now it is an era for definitely a joint replacement is there for a very damaged knee. But uh, with the so many DMODs and different options, regenerative science is always a good option. And till now we are not able to reach to any consensus. And I think osteoarthritis is the most, most complex situation uh, it's different from the rheumatoid arthritis because of a different mechanism for understanding the cellular therapy requirement we need to see what is the current scenario what we want to address actually and how we can go ahead regarding this so definitely uh, osteoarthritis there's so many causes it was very very wonderfully discussed this evening but the most important i'm just taking it with the laxity with the age de degeneration and uh, the laxity of the surrounding muscles. So it has already been discussed beautifully that how the fibrillation and the degeneration start. And we have to take a call at that particular time if you are not going to go for a uh, arthroplasty. And definitely osteoarthritis has got a bumpy road. So many times the people are coming to us, coming to everybody, and they get resolved at early stage, and then they again have a bumpy road, and they again come back to a different orthopedic surgeon. Cellular therapy is the answer, may reverse the arthritis, but to a certain extent only. So definitely that extent we all can understand. That is the grade one to early stages of arthritis, which is well, was again very well uh, explained this evening. So what are the difficulties which we require to find out an answer for the cellular therapy? So it is like a surgical intervention which is not appropriate. A borderline case as a patient who is coming to us with a grade 2 early arthritis, which is going to progress, not responding to the conventional management. Of course, it has to be very well 
taken care of it is osteoarthritis we are not entering into the cppd type of a picture which is again a mixed picture which we have to identify as orthopedic surgeon so as to make a clear cut diagnosis and in india we are again approximately 16000 orthopedic surgeon so you can see and we can uh, estimate how much complex this diagnosis is being made by us most of the time which is not a osteoarthritis and we think it is as a osteoarthritis Anish, so definitely you're not, you're significant you're not able to see a screen is it yeah yeah for the last uh, since you started talking we haven't seen the screen uh, i'm uh, sure others still accept moving. slides are not moving uh, we are not seen nor the slides are moving why and why uh, you you, you can you can stop to share slide. and share again yeah yeah please so kind of you just you just told me just now just a second Uh, Dr. Jha. Yes. So yeah, for this reason, I trialed three times. You know. All right. No, I think it can get rectified. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very nice. Now, now you are here. Yeah. Very good. Very good, Monish. Oh, yeah. oh my God. I'm so sorry for this. Uh, no, 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 no problem. Please continue. so definitely when the patient is of young age and a long long uh, duration has been seen and we know that it is osteoarthritis and patient is not able to be managed by other disease modifying osteoarthritic drug then definitely this is a choice this is a choice now we are discussing since evening about the cartilage regeneration and ultimately what the patient want from us and the what the patient want from us is definitely at that particular time the anti inflammatory the pain killing effect without any you know nasads and all the things which is now a past uh, thing actually for moving this uh, definitely the cartilage repair which has been evolved for the last two decades is micro stimulation i'm not going to detail autologous chondrocyte implantation we all know this thing and latest is oats but again it has got certain disadvantages sometimes as Uh, it has been seen that the long lasting vision in some cases has not been there so for this uh, later on the addition of the mnc cocktail or mesen camel stem cell would give a better result now we have already seen at different forums about what are the stem cells but just to make it very short we are discussing as a orthopedic surgeon the mesen camel stem cells which are present at all the places in the body at each and every tissue in the body and the di tissue discussing this evening is the knee the articular cartilage the subchondral bone which we are discussing since evening that how the changes are been there what we can do for the articular cartilage what we can do for the subchondral bone so as to minimize this thing to go in so the uh, these locations are having a progenitor cells the progenitor cells can be classified again into hematopoietic and mesenchymal and mesenchymal which we are discussing this evening now the different modalities of the cellular therapy which are there in the clinical trials across the globe are prp bone marrow cocktail that is the bone marrow been aspirated out centrifuge and the cocktail is been ready and the mesen camel stem cell which is again a questionable as uh, with the icmr guidelines it is a cultured cell so it is, it should, should not be used unless until the clinical trials are been done so need to understand why and when should be used there are so many supportive literature if you google around it the mesen camel stem cells or the bmac or the prp with or without hyaluronic acid but definitely from india we don't have so much uh, work till now but definitely the clinical trials which are moving across the globe there are so many of them i'm so sorry for the busy slide but definitely only one clinical trial is been done in our country till date 
with the giving of a commercial product for the mizan camel stem cell however the japan this uh, food and uh, drug administration from the korea they are into the market since 2012 with the mizan camel stem cells but in our country only last last year we are able to come out but again it has been fda approved and is it is again a, a conflict of a work between the icmr and different thing which should not be commented at this juncture but as a orthopedic surgeon i think in the coming 3 4 slide all the answers will be there that what we can do for the knee and what our forefathers our professors our seniors used to do when there was nothing available for the osteoarthritis we are discussing for this is only for the mild to moderate cases definitely not for the severe cases now after skeletal maturity we all know that articular cartilage stop proliferating and is slow to replace as well the reason behind is number 1 the lack of blood supply number 2 the chondrocyte which are there they are actually very less mobile because it is in the matrix which is very dense and the limited number of the progenitor cells so there are the three things which needed to be addressed for managing any mild to moderate osteoarthritic cases definitely we know that there is apoptosis there is eating up of chondrocytes with the age everything advances everything goes away with the age so the chondrocytes also goes away with the age so we need to replace them so definitely a balance of the chondrocyte to maintain the matrix between the synthesis and degradation is being disturbed and that is why the patient is coming to us so by now we are very much clear whatever we want to do we have to do only at the cartilage level because the next would be the uh, subchondral bone which is to be involved that means the cartilage is being involved first then the subchondral bone at the most of the time now active chondrocyte how we can have these active chondrocyte at the place definitely by having all those chondroprogenitor cells which are there in the chondrocytes to become active how they can become active of course one answer would be a walking which i'll going to stress later on second answer is definitely the cellular therapy that means platelet rich plasma or the mizan camel stem cells or the commonly which called as the mnc cocktail in early mild to moderate cases depending upon the severity now active chondrocyte means the chondrocytes which can proliferate if they can proliferate they will do their job they will repair it beautifully well they will make it make it very healthy you know so one answer is by cellular therapy that means the mizan camel stem cell or prp or mnc and we are not able to discuss much in detail because we are just touching these topics here this evening but definitely this is a different different answer but as the trials are not been done so definitely we are not in a you know commanding phase but definitely yes the all orthopedic surgeons know that these growth factors which are been secreted by the platelet which are been secreted by the mizan camel stem cell which are been secreted by the hematopoietic stem cells all the monocyte or any dam cells there they have a aim to repair the things very well and the repairing is what the proliferation of the chondrocyte the multiplication of the chondrocyte that so that they can become a healthy so we all know i think this is again touched that the mizan camel stem cells are there in the synovial fluid in the lecture today we have a discussion that synovocytes they produce the synovial fluid but what is a synovocyte synovocytes are nothing but they are these are the mizan camel stem cells which are present hooks and place different places of the body now exercises by the brisk walking means simply the stimulation of a chondrogenic potential of the uh, cartilage or the stimulation of the progenitor cells or the stimulation of the mizan camel stem cells or the stimulation of the synovocytes all the stimulation of the progenitor cells to proliferate that means a brisk walking only in the mild to moderate stage where there is no mechanical de uh, uh, derangement where there is no other uh, pathology in that case it is going to work and that is the reason our professors old professors our teachers and the yoga and all the things if you correlate this thing in the cycle form all the answers will be there but again lack of the evidence as we are the we are into the evidence based medicine
so take home messages would be prp in early osteoarthritis may be useful for early osteoarthritic knee in a given situation mesenchymal stem cells may be of use for mild to moderate condition because they decrease their inflammatory cytokines which you want they are basically the analgesic uh, bullets inside the knees and that is why with the brisk walking as the endorphin has been increased it has been estimated that the thickness of the cartilage also be is been increased and it has been very well reported in the medical fraternity with the medical science now and definitely what the result we are getting from any damn cellular therapy is the paracrine effect here are the few references thank you so much thanks a lot thank you dr manis there could not have there could not have been better explanation of how these stem cells work well uh, manis sub cortical sub uh, uh, cortical cortical injection in, into the uh, sub articular tissue will does that help definitely so it is again the same answer as you have evaluated uh, uh, elated this evening that the subchondral bone is the most important thing not only here even the avascular necrosis head of the femur lot of clinical trial has been done that subchondral bone needs a mesenchymal or cellular therapy or prp injection at the same time 100% marks given to it along with the cartilage so it has to be given there also but again so, uh, because of the lack of the evidences we are not able to make it in a evidence based medicine manner unless until the clinical trials are been done in our country but it has great possibilities now Definitely. Talking, talking about window of opportunity with your stem cells uh, what is your opinion because window of opportunity is provided by removing mechanical load stopping destructive forces on damaged cartilage and it reestablishes joint homeostasis where msc's have been put at the sites of damage perfect perfect sir right so thank you very much and now may i invite again dr s s samarnath from bangalore for his presentation on nuclear synovio orthosis dr samarnath please Thank you, Doctor Jab. Uh, can I share my screen now? Yeah, yeah. Just a second. Right. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to be uh, this, taking uh, this. Yeah. Also, Great. Uh, we should ask Manish also about osteoporosis. How this uh, stem cell can help okay. in the osteoporosis. In, in in the end. We will yeah, yeah. That. Right. right we are able to see the screen now and uh, right. this is going to be a quick fire round because it's going to be only a couple of minutes to talk about and definitely so the new term the new term for a lot of young people and for the senior and the seasoned orthopedic surgeons who probably who have not heard about this term is extremely important radio synovio orthosis RSO, simple terms, simple, very very simple. And what is that? It is it is a, a simple term. RSO gives a, refer to a technique which is already there on the slide. I don't need to really read it, but I will just go on anyway. Now yeah, yeah, yeah. we give into the joint a local application of a radioactive. Yeah. It is not a dye. It could be, but it's a yeah. it's a you know, radioactive yeah. agent, yeah. but. This is given in osteoarthritis. One, it is not just to relieve the pain, not the discomfort, but we need to improve the inflammation so that the patient who is receiving it gets a better, you know, uh, uh, or shall I say, effect, pain-free, uh, you know, joint. So there are. This is not a new technique. In, to tell you frankly, it's been there for a long time now. It's about forty plus odd years now. Many of the orthopedic surgeons are not even born when this technique was. you know uh, stipulated there are a few reasons why it did not take up in the big way in those days because of the availability of the nuclear you know uh, isotope which was very very restricted in many of the countries as well as in india 
and uh, we need to have a governmental, uh, you know, uh, clearance to get those radioactive down uh, the agents into because it's uh, very highly radiating. So we have to be very careful in those things. Keeping that in mind, yes, uh, you know, back in the 60s, when uh, Delabre talk about uh, this entire thing to restore the knee joint in a better way by injecting the radionucleotides into the joint to make it uh, non-surgical or probably a radiosinovectomy kind of a thing, term which was, uh, you know, nomenclated those days. And it was forgotten because of the availability of the centers in the country and the world as well. So let me uh, run through that. Now, yes, the radiopharmaceutical industry has grown up in a massive way. Uh, uh, as Dr. Jha mentioned earlier on, a PET, uh, ordinary CT to PET CT to PET MRI, and a lot of things have been done. So keeping that in mind, what is that we use here? For uh, larger joints, we have atrium 90 and uh, rhenium and erbium also available. But the majority of the joints which we talk about is into the knee joint today. So let us focus on the knee joint. Atrium 90 is the one which has been used in a big way. And what happens there? I mean, this colloidal injection causes you know, the phagocytosis, which is already there, which Manish talked about a lot of things in the past, uh, in, in, the, in his last few slides. And the changes which happened, what Abai also talked about, uh, in, in the condition, what happens with the pathogenesis, what, uh, you know, uh, Dilip talked. We try to give the injection, and when one injection is given, it forms a sclerosis or fibrosis. The synovial stroma, the villi will be affected, and then it gets devascularized and then the cartilage becomes thicker and you know pain free for them in the, it takes a few weeks to months for that to get the effect and yes there are this is going to be just a bird's eye view for you people uh, basically the dose again dose is variation because of the joint involvement will be different and again in the, in the knee joint we talk about 185 mega or 5m curie uh, atrium to be given and in a year you know, those, uh, those cannot be increased because the, like in a hyaluronic acid or a steroid, people have given repeat injections. But here, we need to be very specific and not to repeat too many times. So there has been a very clear cut understanding on that. That does not take too much time there. Uh, now, yeah, we talk about the dosage. We came there. 185 we talked about. So that is where the knee joint uh, atrium uh, dose will be coming to. And what happens? Can we give multiple joints? You know, both the knee joints or single uni or you know bilateral can be given. It can be, but again, we need to assess the you know uh, the dosage as well as the uh, patient's uh, body structure, and they talk about it. So, with that in mind, uh, yes, there could be good results. They may not be that so good results. There are a lot of reasons for that, but we need to make sure uh, how we can uh, differentiate it and take it forward. The second dose also can be given in about uh, probably eight to 10 months time. And uh, many a times when the osteoarthritis starts, people have also have injected into the cyst and it has regressed very, very you know, uh, beautifully there. So the side effects, yeah, like in any drug, no drug is uh, safe. So every drug is a poison in the true sense of term. Even this has some amount of side effects. Being in, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, injectable kind of a thing. Uh, so we need to be careful about the infection, make sure all the sterile precautions have been taken care. Of. And then I don't think there's a major issue, but except some neoplasm has been documented, but they, we need to look into in a larger study. Contraindication, obviously, because the knee joint osteoarthritis is not limited to old age. Younger people can come in, even in pregnancy, people have had seen this. So this particular injection cannot be given in uh, you know, pregnancy and lactation. So that's very, very clear cut indication. And some of the conditions where we can indicate from rheumatoid arthritis, I know we are talking about osteoarthritis, because all these things can give us a secondary osteoarthritis, hence the list have been put here. So these are the kind of uh, uh, precursors where the osteoarthritis knee can be seen, so this can be used. And special precaution with hemophilics, uh, they should have a proper workup done. And now, the effect, we talk about how good is it? So naturally, we talk about the knee joint, 77% they have seen good results, and it's almost maintained that in the end of two years. So 
it is it is it is a very good uh, you know thing to look into in the future and definitely there's a lot of study need to be done yes there's going to be a lot of radiation comes into picture so we need to be taking care of all those uh, precautions and uh, the methods are also different and how we going to inject it and how we going to dilute it all those things have to be given and one thing as we talked about any injection going into the joint can cause some of the inflammation and thankfully unlike in uh, a hyaluronic acid uh, a steroid can be uh, utilized to reduce the inflammation uh, post radiation you know or what we call it as radiosynovia orthosis so that is the biggest thing and the side effects we want to talk about i think a livid it could be a simple infection a joint infection is a very serious one simple uh, you know we have to be careful about but we have to rule out the inflammatory response Response to infection that has to be made very very clear. That has to be differentiated. So that that has to be worked out and clearly explained to the patient. And mind you, we have to have a proper counselling and consenting, and we need to have a regular and uh, follow up so that patient gets a big uh, you know cheerleader for us. In the past, radiologists used to be doing all the works, the radio diagnosis. Today. thankfully the radio diagnosis has been super specialized so we don't need to worry about he or she being pulled in different directions thank you thank you with my uh, with this i think i will probably uh, end my slide and uh, thank you dr jaya and thank you uh, shiva navin and everybody to give me a, a birds eye view on the radio synovio orthosis what we talk about hopefully uh, this should be able to give a uh, precursor for to do the future studies thank you right thank you dr ramarnath for making at least this world world very popular synovio orthosis now as you have rightly said that we have to have familiarity with this science which has not been explored by we orthopedic surgeons many of us may not be knowing but since the facilities are there at many centers in a metropolis at few centers in larger cities i think we orthopedic surgeons have to be conscious of using this modality of management of osteoarthritis where there is activated synovitis well there is a drawback that at one go we have to have 10 patients club together because the nuclear material that comes is meant for being used in 10 joints so thank you thank you very much dr amarnath now dr manish khanna prof sir. manish khanna are you there sir sir oh, sir sir okay. sir okay now it is my turn can i have your permission Sir, sir, please, please. Okay, okay. My cursor. I am not able to see my cursor. How do I go about it? Yes, now I get my cursor. Uh, showing the last slide first. I will come to the first also when you are there. So, friends. the whole subject of osteoarthritis has been discussed in the light of the changing trend of its pathogenesis and hence a likely change in the trend of management so let me embark upon what future holds well friends before i really talk about future i was attending one of the indian orthopedic association webinars and there somebody said that steroids are not to be used so let me first of all say that what are the various drugs which could be used by intra articular route corticosteroids tops the list hyaluronic acid we have just now talked and the other treatment modalities which are still in the stage of experimentation 
and has not got approval or TNF inhibitor. And mind you, very simple, capsaicin also has been found to be used intraarticularly. Topical use was existing for a long time. Intraarticular capsaicin injection has found to be useful and it is said that the afferent, afferent nerve fibers within the joints, they, they get damaged and hence the patient does not perceive it. The small molecules, their intraarticular use in the form of BNTA also has been used. Botulinum toxin, which normally is used for treatment in, in uh, mainly the cerebral palsy patients, their intraarticular use have also been, ha have achieved some success, but still is not recommended. Well, coming back to the topic of corticosteroids, I must tell that US FDA has approved corticosteroids for intraarticular injection, and they are in various forms, beta-methasone acetate, dexamethasone, methyl prednisolone, triamcinolone. Now the intraarticular corticosteroid guidelines in osteoarthritis, they are not uniform recommendations. So for knee osteoarthritis, hip, hand osteoarthritis, if we take these three into consideration, American College of Rheumatology and Arthritis Foundation guidelines in 2019, only two years earlier, they strongly recommended for knee and also for hip and conditionally recommended for hand. OARC guidelines, again from 2019, they conditionally recommended it for knee and did not mention about hip and hand. AAOS had inconclusive or limited evidence in 2013 for the knee joint, but in 2017, they strongly said it should be used in the hip joint. Now coming to the recent advances in the management of osteoarthritis, I will be highlighting two points. Introduction of new therapeutic agent, and number two, introduction of evolution of sophisticated drug delivery system. Now friends, WNT signaling pathway is a pathway which exists and stimulates production of catabolic proteases. This is implicated in matrix degradation. It modulates differentiation of osteoblast and chondrocytes. Now, following consequences of long-term intraarticular glucocorticoid, evolution of small molecule inhibitor of WNT signally pathway was developed, which deserves our attention. For quite some time, this particular drug, which is a WNT pathway inhibitor, was known by the eponym SM04690. But now it has a name, it is still has not been marketed, but Loresi Vivint. Loresi Vivint is a WNT pathway inhibitor and it has disease modifying possibility. Now, this particular drug, when used intraarticularly, might cause cartilage regeneration and protection from cartilage catabolism. So claims of significant difference in joint space width. Mind you, the standard of development of a DMOD drug is that if the drug can reduce or rather can increase the depth of the joint, that is to be approved. So here there is likely improvement in the joint space width. And as I had told you earlier, phase two trial is under process and will examine these things. Now, the second point that I wanted to highlight that there has been introduction of evolution of sophisticated drug 
delivery system. Normally, what happens when we inject a steroid into the joint, the effects they fade, start fading away within two to four weeks. So, to prolong the action of glucocorticoid, if at all it has to be used, introduction of new delivery system known as polymicrospheres. In short, it is known as PLGA, polylactic co-glycolic acid. So, these techno this technological advance in targeted delivery approach has been approved by FDA for knee osteoarthritis. It is not pending approval. It is already approved. So, we are repurposing and older existing drug in the new format, which again had an eponym FX006, but now it has a name, Gilreta. And this is an, nothing but an extended release formulation of synthetic triamcinolone acetonide, which is loaded on PLGA microspheres. This maintains concentration in the joint for several months after a single dose and pain relief is greater up to 5 to 10 weeks. So, as I told you, degree of joint space narrowing, which we know also by the uh, cartigram MRI, which says what is the depth of the articular cartilage, so it can have a prognostic value as well because subsequent TKR is positively a possibility within 15 years. How? For each one degree rate of tibial cartilage loss, 20% increased risk of undergoing TKR within four years. So, cartigram becomes a useful investigative tool where we can prognosticate. Now, the third thing that I want to say, and I have said it earlier in a, on a platform which was conducted by Dr. Amarnath on osteoarthritis, that though this will be something like a loud mouth speaking, but maybe in coming 50 years, joint replacement may be a thing of the past because there are gene therapy mechanisms available and gene therapy also is intra-articular and this gene therapy could be cell-based as Dr. Manish Khanna has already said, but this gene therapy also is virus, is also through the help of a adenovirus. So this is initially developed for overcoming pharmacokinetic barriers, delivering biologics to the joints, great potential in treatment of diseases, including OA and definitely RA also. After 25 years of development, arthritis gene therapy is entering in clinical practice. US FDA in 2017, approved three new gene therapeutics and South Korean Ministry of Food and Drug Safety approved first arthritis gene therapy, which goes by the name Invosa. Now gene transfer and expression of gene in a joint by residing cells, therapeutic gene products synthesized indigenously and continually be synthesized for potentially extended period of time. As I was just now telling that adeno-associated virus will uh, uh, has emerged as a popular vector for in vivo delivery. This virus is safe, effective, and less immunogenic. Now you can look into this, something like a space, a space aircraft, a spacecraft. This is the new gene modified DNA which is incorporated into the virus, is entering into the capsule, and finally, the, the gene modifies the, uh, uh, the structures there 
inside the cell. Well, gene therapy, the intra-articular recombinant adenovirus transduces synovial lining cells as well as the chondrocytes throughout thickness of the articular cartilage. Considerable advantage in osteoarthritis in which chondrocyte dysfunction has a key role. In VOSA, we already know, is the fifth gene therapy approved product for anywhere in the world, and it is second for a non-lethal disease. Well, this genetic medicine for arthritis may have a future and likely to be widely available by middle of the next decade. Friends, coming to the fourth point, small molecules. Well, the idea that progression of osteoarthritis is results because of imbalance between catabolic and anabolic factors. Now, there is something known as ECM, extracellular matrix. Degradation of extracellular matrix underlies loss of cartilage tissue in osteoarthritis. Now, BNPA, which is an intra-articular format of small molecule, this is stimulates expression of uh, extracellular matrix components while simultaneously suppresses the inflammatory mediators. Intra-articular injection of BNTA also delay, delays the disease progression. Well, friends, we can see, we did not talk about parathormone, but this is also one drug which helps as an anti-resorbed uh, parathormone and other anti-resorptive drugs like strontium, uh, renylate, cathepsin K, and bisphosphonate, and they have their own path of action. And this is where osteoporosis is taken care of, what Dr. Dilip just now wanted to know. Now, coming to opioids, uh, 2017, you et al. said that there is a substantial risk and should be reserved only for patient not opting arthroplasty. So limited role with eye on adverse effect must be seen. Now friends, there is a silver lining in the medical management of osteoarthritis in sulfasalazine and small molecules. So sulfasalazine and tofacitinib, they have, they work on the protein portion of the articular chondrocytes, and it has opened new vista in the management. The novel functional aspect of tofacitinib is that claims to promote cartilage extracellular matrix generation and increases, increases cellular levels of adenosine known to have anti-inflammatory effect. Now, sulfasalazine inhibits tumor necrosis factor alpha expression, so may reduce secretion of inflammatory cytokine such as interleukin IL-8. IL-8 is in fact a small cytokine which goes by the name of chemokine also. It might suppress B cell function as well. Well, in short, sulfasalazine has antibacterial effect, anti-inflammatory effect, and immunomodulatory effect as well. Well, these have been talked about and as I have told you, that US FDA and EMA says that approval of DMOAD requires inhibition of loss in knee or hip space, joint space width on plain radiograph with relevant symptomatic benefit. And here, oh, so many products uh, uh, can be seen, which Dr. Raza has also talked about, which uh, Dr. Uh, Elhens also talked about. NSAID is tramadol, duloxetine. Duloxetine is one drug which can be used in patients with persisting pain in spite of NSAID and chondroitin. Well, other drugs we have already talked about, but here you will find colchicine, tranexamic acid, vitamin D, uh, also hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine, now, there are many drugs in the pipeline. Why have we thought of talking about osteoarthritis vis-a-vis -vis the drugs that are in the pipeline? 
So if you look into them, that what are the various targets and what are the molecules, I will not read each one of them, but you can look at them that so many are there in the pipeline. And the targets could be IL-1, TNF-alpha, toll-like receptor, other targets. And nerve growth factor is also one very important target on which tenezumab works. So even COX-2 and T2M, including metformin is one drug which is likely to be effective. Similarly, statins, all the various statins are also being worked. And friends, I would like to conclude that what future holds are in the already proved in the hands of uh, 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 development of new therapeutic agent, Loresi Vivint, which is a WNT pathway inhibitor, the uh, introduction of evolution of sophisticated drug delivery system like PLGA, extended release formulation of uh, FX006 Gilorata, which is synthetic triamcinolone, intra-articular gene therapy, is small molecules targeting bone remodeling also raises hope for treating osteoporosis and osteoarthritis by regenerating both bone and articular cartilage. And last but not the least, inhibitor of MMP13 also is equally important and is likely to be topping the list of the drugs treating osteoarthritis. Friends, I will like to end with a quote which was there in one of the editorials written by Charles J. Malmud from Cleveland, Ohio. And it was written in the journal Future Drug, Drug Discovery in 2019. He says, however, I believe at this, that one thing is certain, that one thing is certain, what? It was previously proposed that since many of the cellular events characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis overlap, overlap at some time with those in OA, which we have talked in this uh, webinar, why not use those accumulated successes in the drug therapy of rheumatoid arthritis to treat osteoarthritis? I will read it once again. One thing is certain. It was previously proposed that since many of the cellular events characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis overlap at some time with those in osteoarthritis patients, why not use those accumulated successes in the drug therapy of rheumatoid arthritis to treat osteoarthritis? Friends, this was the stimulus to have this webinar and I firmly hope that we have not talked anything which did not have a merit. We have talked about TNF-alpha inhibitors, but simultaneously we have said that none of the series TNF-alpha inhibitors have been successful till date. And these TNF inhibitors have been used intra-articularly. And any DMODs which are being developed, they will have to be used intra-articularly because the systemic effects may not allow their constant use. Thank you, friends. Thank you very much, Dr. Manis. Thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful presentation, giving the insight of everything which is still in pipeline. Thank you so much. Right, th friends. Now... Uh, so you can stop sharing your screen. I am going to do that. My cursor is lost. Okay. So in the meantime, since the video uh, audio is working, I am trying to close it. So uh, let us discuss about uh, various inputs or various questions. Are there any questions, doctor? So there's no question in the chat box, actually. Oh, okay, may not be a question. So, uh, Dr. Dilip, you wanted to say something. 
Dr. Dilip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, they partly you have given the answer. That is why I'm uh, stopping. Actually, I don't like to ask uh, uh, Manish about that thing. But okay. one thing is uh, one thing is important that uh, it is a disease. Uh, not only the bone and the cartilage, but all the tissues around the joint are affected. Including I can the see. I can see Dr. Yes. Sivshankar, President of Indian Orthopedic Association. Is he come here? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I am there right from the uh, beginning. Okay. I heard your lecture also, uh, You, you yeah. will have a hundred years of life. You know, we are thinking of you, Sivshankar. Yes, thank you, thank you. We are thinking okay. of you. Good evening, sir. Yes. And you so, just appeared. Eh? So, good evening, Sip Shankar. Good evening, uh, good evening. Yeah, your, yeah. your comments, valued comments. Uh, definitely, this is a, a, what the regular osteoarthritis we were do, dealing earlier. Uh, it seems to be very superficial when uh, I hear this webinar that. Uh, Everything has gone back to the level of cellular, microcellular, and also uh, it appears sometimes like it is a whether I am attending a osteoarthritis webinar or a rheumatology webinar. So definitely, I, I, yeah. I, I must tell you, sir, this is your rheumatology <laughs> subcommittee <laughs> doing justice with this. <laughs> so that's what I am telling. So definitely, there are so many things which are happening and. Uh, Glad to know there are so many newer drugs and medicines are in the pipeline which will be available for the benefit of us. Hopefully, we'll have someday some vaccine to prevent. Uh, we probably will have some genes to modify the disease before this happens in a potentially a prone patient or a prone uh, candidate. Or let's we'll have a, something, a magic vaccine probably for this to prevent this osteoarthritis uh, in future. Thank you very much. I must congratulate uh, the enthusiasm with which you have been conducting and also sharing slides in between the presentations to uh, add value to the presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Right. Except Thank the first you. talk, I was there all throughout. I uh, joined while Dr. Majumdar was talking. Yeah. Uh, uh, from, yeah, yeah. from our inner conscience, we were definitely missing you and we were thinking that uh, whole exercise has gone futile since no. you are not there. Uh, I was very happy to see that you were attending it. Uh, any questions are there? Dr. Manis? Uh, chat box, uh, chat box. Chat box is empty for reason that our doctors have started. I like to ask if there is any questions on the Artho TV or IOA TV channel. YouTube uh, channel, okay. Okay, uh, and Dr. Yogesh, are you there? No, he is. Okay. Nothing. Yogesh, Yogesh has signed off. Okay, does not matter. Uh, he was uh, sitting for quite some time. Yes, yes, you please, Dr. Amarnath. Huh. Thank you. I, I think, see, one with the, uh, the cellular therapy, what Manish talked about, and then you also rightly mentioned about the delivery system. See, now the beautiful, I mean, uh, invention of the delivery system, it's one of the best thing. Unfortunately, the pandemic has come in obviously, so I'll not comment on that, but the best delivery system is to put a package onto the virus and inject into the body wherever you want. And that creates history. And that delivery system, as I rightly said, uh, Dr. Jha, the adenovirus virus has been picked up with a very, very simple, non-infective and a huge amount of multiplying, uh, you know, uh, what shall I say, the ability of the virus. And to subside the kind of target cells which is going to be given and the target what it's supposed to do, does it fantastically. So no wonder, I think the future definitely is going to be there. As uh, Shushankar said, the microcellular DNA level, and we are at it. It's going to be in a big way. And it's going to be in a big way. Uh, the surgical versus non-surgical and, uh, you know, the right choice of the patients comes into picture and future is something different. I mean, we're talking digital today and instead of physical, similarly, the kind of changes that we are going to see in the therapy is going to be humongous, humongous. And this delivery system module of adenovirus is going to be here 
for everything what we are going to do i think manish can comment or anybody uh, bef- before that i want to add one thing uh, dr amarnath you had drawn my attention that in uh, western countries there is a combination of prelocane along with hyaluronic acid yes available in the market and they say that lidocaine or other uh, other anesthetic agents they do not form a stable component with hyaluronic acid this is one which makes a stable component and there is an excipient as well so that combination is uh, tremendously in use your comments on this particular product lidocaine so, plus yeah. so in fact i will not bring in the i mean uh, the brand name and things so it's already available and the there are a few of the uh, trade partners who are looking into that in a big way we have discussed in a massive way in the last 6 uh, months to 8 months about this product to come into india and obviously with the pandemic a lot of files have been kept in uh, you know behind for us to get it through so it is going to be coming in probably 2022 with another few months time down the line hopefully we should be able to bring it out in india so that is one thing which is going to be uh, one of the game changer for us now and second thing even this is also a very high uh, you know molecular weight uh, uh, substance and the beauty of this is if we don't have to give a large amount like 6 ml into the joint it comes in 2 ml and 1 ml with prilocaine so we can use it in the smaller joints as well so even for the knee joint 2 ml is sufficient and it does magic we have to say for example now uh, uh, any given hyaluronic acid be it uh, uh, the originator molecule or the biosimilar they take about 6 to 8 weeks to act but here what happens it's almost 24 hours to 48 hours they get a beautiful relief of pain which is fantastic and the you know the hyaluronic acid the which is high molecular weight i think it's more than 10 uh, 10 or 20 uh, i think 10 or 15 thousand uh, uh, daltons so that's going to be very very good and it is going to be uh, effective for the next one year they say 8 to 10 months or maybe one year because of the plasma half life is much longer than the existing ones so the dosage is small and it can be used in the smaller joints as well and the frequency is going to be less and it's almost immediate effect because of the anesthetic which is there and the prilocaine also has been given on a longer uh, you know chain so that uh, anesthesia effect or the analgesic effect goes longer this is my comment sir and we will be getting it we will be coming out soon on that right uh, talking about one more product calcitonin which has been withdrawn from the mar- western markets western world markets uh it is again has come back and the oral use not the nasal use oral use of calcitonin for treatment of osteoarthritis has been brought back uh so this this drug is to be looked for uh, as a future utility drug well See, dr raja dot yes in fact dr abai mentioned about the you know uh, the study which was done for the calcitonin the, we were using calcitonin for injections in the past i mean it was banned across the world including india obviously now the nasal was restricted again they were using right left center but again due to the carcinogenic effect it was withheld now with the study coming into the oral thing what you rightly said and what uh, dr abai also mentioned about it's a different formulation altogether and then we haven't seen that kind of a challenges there right i think so, abhay or raja can talk on that probably uh, dr raja any comments on this calcitonin or and also on intra articular capsaicin injection which uh, seems to have a very good uh, uh, popularity now and is rather advocacy now that it also works well but the uh, problem with this all this uh, osteoarthritis research and the outcome is there's a big overlap between the placebo and the uh, drugs so all these uh, uh, interventions are limited because even with the placebo you are able to achieve uh, better results so somebody intervened in between the sets synvis one was uh, working wonderfully but the international recommendation is against the use of hyaluronic acid only for really uh, symptomatic patient 
So there's a lot of overlap between uh, placebo and uh, these therapeutic interventions. So we need more research and further follow-up into these drugs. Uh, right. Talking about placebo, this is one thing that which I keep on talking about that uh, any, any trial is compared with a placebo. And then placebo also gives uh, sometimes comparable results. So psyche becomes so very much important. Any comments on this placebo compar comparative uh, therapeutic trial? Uh, Dr. Sivsankar, we were talking about the use of placebo in various trials. And to our utter surprise, many a times the placebo also gives either compare, comparable or somewhat oh. comparable results. So any comments on use of placebo? Okay, two things. One we should know. See, many of the it's just marginally better than something else. So the, everybody wants to sell their product and they come with the research saying that it's uh, equivalent to placebo or slightly better than placebo. It is our judgment, we should use it. And uh, I, at present, I feel that uh, this is uh, what a webinar I'm looking at is for general orthopedic surgeons and it is uh, uh, going through a very uh, poor specialty area. Uh, so it, I think it's too much at present, that's what I feel. That, so, uh, that, that now we are overshot by 35 minutes. Okay, so we yeah. will cl close it now. Yes. Uh, and vote of thanks is to be... Uh, let, me start, let me start thanking because I was not there initially. Let oh, me uh, start the person who is missing, Dr. Uh, Yogesh Kamat, then Dr. Amarnath, Dr. Kamlesh uh, Tiwari, our uh, subcommittee chairman. Thank you, Kamlesh ji. I missed you at Ranchi. And Dr. Dilip Majumdar, President of Ayora, Danshekar Raja from Coimbatore, Abai Allen from Jodhpur, Professor Manish Kanna from IORA, then Ortho TV team, Ashok Sham and IOT team, Dr. Shamshal Huda for all the help. So I thank everybody for this wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are honored by your presence in, even in the end. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Raja, okay. You can stop. Uh, Thank you very much. Ashok, you can stop live streaming. So, Ra Raja should convey to Deen Dayal. Eh? Yes. Samsung? Deen Dayal. Deen Dayal is there in Coimbatore. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you convey my regards to him. Sure, Dr. Sure, Huda, sure. you can stop the live streaming. Dr. Huda, are you there? And one, I will be there tomorrow by this. Yeah, tomorrow will be coming to our, our, our place. Sip yes, tomorrow, yes, tomorrow evening this time I will be here with you. Yes. No, no, tomorrow you will be here, na, Sip Sankar. Yeah, this time I will be in your office. Don't worry. Bye. Now? All right. Okay. His connection is slow, so it will take some time. No, Raja, you must convey to two persons. Huh? Sure, sure. One is Dindayal and another is a, that spine fellow. What is that name? Tall fellow? Ashikara. Yeah, Ajay Prasad Shetty. No, no, spine fellow. He was a co Huh? Ashikara. No, Ajay Shetty, you are telling? No, no, in Coimbatore. Goga Hospital. Ajay and Rishi are there. Fine. No, no, one that they are... Uh, I... Why is a pediatrician or something? Is a DNB examiner, Raja? Yes, yes, yes. He's also a DNB examiner? So, Dr. Ja, thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure to have been associated and share some thoughts and then learn a lot of things from all the people. No, no, it is a revolutionary thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I wonder that uh, if these developments come, then where will we stand? 
So friends, <laughs> this is going to be the last of the series. Okay. And we are not going to have any further uh, webinars because now this is the month of September, uh, October, November, and then you have conference. So we will meet, we'll meet in Goa. Uh, yes, we huh? will meet in Goa and I am thankful to all the faculty members who are present, all the other faculty members who, have, who are not present today, tremendous support I had of everybody. I am so very grateful. Thank you.